Welcome everyone to today's Meet the Kavli Laureates and a special welcome and congratulations to our guests. We're thrilled you're here. My name is Nancy Baselchuk and I'm a science writer here at NTNU and... And I'm Unni Aikiset and I work as a science educator, uh, science teacher educator also here at NTNU. And without further ado, our first speaker is uh, my boss, mm. Anna Borg, NTNU Rector, who will welcome us and today's guests. Anna, please. Dear Kavli Prize laureates, President, of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, Lise Evros, honored guests and good colleagues, and more than that, you young students and students-to-be. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome you back to the celebration of the Kavli Prize laureates here at NTNU and in Trondheim. Let me just briefly say a few words for the new participants in the room. The Kavli Prize Week is a biannual celebration of science and a great opportunity for dialogues on significant research fields. And since 2008, it has been a tradition that the laureates in nanoscience and neuroscience come to Trondheim and to NTNU as part of the Kavli Week. Congratulations to all 11 laureates that are present here today. Your scientific achievements are inspiring to us all. Before the break, we honored the laureates awarded the Kavli Prize in Nanoscience 2020 and 2022. And this afternoon session, we will honor the laureates awarded the Kavli Prize in Neuroscience 2020 and 2022. We will meet four scientists recognized for the discovery of genes that indirectly cause a number of serious brain diseases. And two scientists honored for their transformative discovery of receptors for temperature and pressure. But before we begin, President Lise Evros from the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters will say a few words. Thank you for your attention. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rector Anneborg, for this warm welcome. We are very grateful to you and to Antienu for hosting the symposia in nanoscience and neuroscience since the first Kavli Prize Week was arranged in 2008. Your strong research group in both these fields adds value to our scientific exchange during the days we spend here in Trondheim. As you mentioned, Fred Kavli was studying physics at former NTH, Norwegian Institute of Technology, no NTNU, and he continued his strong ties and collaboration with Norway throughout his life. Upon completing his study, he moved to Canada and then the United States, where he later founded the Kavliko Corporation. And under his leadership, the company became one of the world's largest suppliers of sensors for aeronautical automotive and industrial application. Fred Kavli established the Kavli Foundation in 2000. After that, he initiated the Kavli Prize, which is a partnership between the Ministry of Education and Research in Norway, the Kavli Foundation, and the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. The Kavli Prize honors scientists for breakthrough in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience transforming our understanding of the biggest, the smallest, and the most complex. Fred Kavli 
founded these prizes to honor scientists and to recognize outstanding research, while also promoting and celebrating science with the public, inspiring and encouraging their curiosity, support, and appreciation of science. Today, we are following his example, bringing together the science, the public interested in science, you that are here today, and the great scientists that we will meet soon, our own Kavli Prize laureate. Enjoy the day. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Anna and Lisa. Our 2020 Kavli laureates in neuroscience have changed the way that we understand the perception of temperature and touch. First, we have a video in which the laureates themselves will talk about their work. So, roll them. Studying sensory systems is a really unique aspect of biology because um, you know, every creature sees the world in a different way. You know, we see the world in a different way than a honeybee or a snake, and that really depends upon the, you know, the biophysical and molecular sensors that we have in our bodies that interpret all these signals from our environment and then convert this information that our brain can kind of reconstruct as our world. Over the last few decades, we have learned a lot about how we see, smell, taste. Uh, of course, smelling and tasting is all based on chemical sensing. And this is actually the language that uh, most of our cells in our bodies use to communicate with each other. But the somatosensation, which is sense of touch, pain, proprioception, etc., all of these depend on sensing physical stimuli, which is very different. So how do you sense temperature? How do you sense pressure? And translate this into a language that neurons understand, which is an electrical signal, was not known. It was known that these specialized uh, proteins called ion channels exist, but their identity was not known. So my lab has found ion channels responsible for pressure and earlier work in, in temperature. What your skin is sensing is the indentation. So any times you touch, your skin is being indented. What's really fascinating is we say there's the sensor in the skin, but actually most of the sensing is happening at this very, very thin, very long projection of a sensory neuron that starts in the back of your spinal cord. This neuron sends processes everywhere in your body, including the skin. And at the tips of these neurites, there are sub-micrometer in length sits this tiny, tiny ion channel, which is in nanometers length, that when the plasma membrane, which is the fatty surrounding of a cell that protects the cell, there's this little protein sitting there. And this protein um, is, is, as you can see here, is a molecule that comes with three identical members in different colors. They come together and sit in the membrane shown in this green color, and they actually bend the plasma membrane. This piezo-2 protein, there's two of them, we call them piezo-1 and 2, are proteins that are encoded by DNA, and so a gene. So there's this gene that its only role is to make a protein that sits in a few cell types on the membrane, and its only job is to sense pressure. And when this cell gets pushed or dented, they flatten. And when this flattens, conformation of the protein changes and ions start flowing through this protein. And when that happens, you have the first signal that starts the process that we call touch. What molecules in our body is it that react to heat and cold? At least as far as we know, most of these molecules belong to the same family of membrane proteins, these ion channels called trip channels which are actually first discovered in flies, in fruit flies. But in mammals, um, a number of them, different ones, and we don't know yet which, all the ones that contribute to temperature sensation, but at least two of the ones that we've looked at, the receptor for chili peppers, for capsaicin, and the receptor for menthol, these TRIP-V1 and TRIP-MA channels, they belong, they're sort of molecular cousins in the same gene family, and one of them senses heat, and one of them senses cold. So this is a model of the capsaicin receptor. This hole in the middle, opens up like a donut hole, and it allows ions to flow 
down their what we call electrochemical gradient. So outside there's a lot of sodium ions and the sodium ions rush into the cell and you know the currency of communication in the nervous system is electricity. So when ions are flowing across the membrane like that it generates an electrical current and then this excites the neuron. That initial excitation is then carried along the neuron, say from your finger, all the way along into your spinal cord. That information gets relayed to another neuron that carries that ultimately to your brain. Your ability to recognize something hot or cold is determined by the biophysical properties of this protein, which is really kind of a magnificent thing. Right? Our route to discovering that was a little bit indirect in that we didn't ask, we didn't go in first asking what are the molecules that sense temperature. We asked what are the molecules that sense these pungent agents, you know, these natural products, menthol, cap, first capsaicin and then menthol. And, and with capsaicin we identified this channel and we knew it was going to likely be important for some aspect of pain sensation but we didn't really know what the endogenous normal activator, physiologic activator might be. So we threw all kinds of things at it that we thought made sense in the context of pain, like neuropeptides, neurotransmitters, and didn't really find anything that seemed to be consequential. And so then we decided, you know, our pain system does more than detect chemicals. It detects physical forces like touch or temperature. And so we tried changing temperature. Cold didn't do anything to the capsaicin receptor, but heat did. And so we realized that we had, that the capsaicin receptor and the heat receptor were the same. And you know, in retrospect, of course, everybody thinks we made the connection right away because you eat a chili pepper. And, um, but it didn't have to be that way. It could just be that they're on the same cells and you activate the same pathway. Uh, and so that was kind of a, you know, eureka moment when we realized that this is kind of a, a very parsimonious explanation for your everyday experience. Among sensory systems, I always say, I think the somatic sensation and pain is probably the one that's most important for our survival and well-being. Because if you don't have it, you really have trouble knowing, you know, learning how to avoid things that can be injurious. Please welcome on stage David Julius and Ardem Pataputian. Cool. You sit here. Okay. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say. Um, in case our audience doesn't know, that, although I'm guessing many do, David Julius and Ardem Pataputian were also winners of the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So maybe a little... <laughs> Just warming you up for Stockholm. <laughs> so I wanted to start with a... Oh, I guess I should sit down. Sorry. Too much energy. <laughs> I want to start with a question for both of you, which is, um, you, you've said, one or both of you have said that the sense of touch is the least well understood of the senses until clearly both of your discoveries. But for those in the audience who are not neuroscientists, can you talk about why it's been so much harder to understand touch than the other senses? Because for us as non-neuroscientists, mm -hmm. they all look magic. <laughs> So do you, who wants to start? Well, I, I think for, sensory, for other sensory systems, for example, and we talked about this uh, you know, recently, is that for vision, for example, or for, uh, particularly for vision, let's say, you know, there was a lot of biochemical evidence that preceded the molecular genetic identification of molecules involved in the visual senses. And, and to some extent, that's also been true for, um, uh, for taste and smell maybe not necessarily biochemistry, but at least pharmacology, that let us know what types of molecules to expect, namely G-protein-coupled receptors that detect, and in all these systems, as Artem says in his, in his video, they're involved in sensing chemical stimuli. And so I think there were clues as to what sorts of molecules to look for genetically using molecular genetics. And also, you know, in those systems, the, the apparatus is confined to one part of the body. So, you know, everything happens in the eyeball. You can take that out of, you know, 100 cows and fractionate and do biochemistry or in the nose to, do, to know exactly where to do molecular genetic studies to look for transducers. Whereas in the pain pathway uh, or the somatosensory pathway, you know, the detectors are spread throughout your body. Now, you can go to certain ganglia 
like dorsal root or trigeminal ganglia to identify these things, but technically it's much more difficult. And because those cells are sensing a wider array of things, not just chemicals, but as Artem said, physical forces, the types of molecules that we were looking for were, you know, there weren't as many clues as to what we should look for. So, so it's all about clues. Yeah, so we needed to, to develop new sort of functional assays to identify these things without being able to take too many lessons from other sensory systems. Anything to add? I think David did a great job. I, I, I would just even extend that and say, not just compared to other sensory systems, you know, cells communicate through chemicals, whether it's hormones or small molecules. And so, uh, as David said, we know a lot about how this works. The chemical binds to a receptor, there's a conformational chain signal happens. Here we're talking about temperature and pressure. And so there isn't much precedence about not just what the molecules are, but once you find them, how would they be activated by changes in physics? <laughs> right? um, and so that's part of the challenge in addition to everything else David said. And it's really interesting that this, uh, the, the chili peppers, that we, we sense them the same way that we sense uh, hot temperature. Mm -hmm. Is there, here we have a chili pepper, we're not going to eat it though, but uh, <laughs> we, know, we know it can really <laughs> feel like yeah, burning hot. Uh, so do we have any clues to why? Why do they, are we using the same receptors for these? I think it's an accident of evolution. And this little pepper, has um, evolved to produce a compound, these vanilloid or capsicum compounds that you know, are very good at activating molecules in our pain pathway. And that protects the pepper from predation mm -hmm. by a squirrel or a deer. You know, we as humans, well, we like to do things that hurt ourselves. You know, we like to sort of straddle that edge between pleasure and pain. And so, you know, we smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol and things like that. And we eat chili peppers, so, but, um, other intelligent animals like squirrels <laughs> know, know that that's generating a pain response. So it's really an accident of evolution, but has been, um, but has been stabilized by the fact that it, it protects the, the plant and its seeds from predation. But isn't it so interesting that almost all languages, and I don't know what it is mm -hmm. in Norwegian, it says hot for, for chili yeah. peppers. So, uh, you know, people have conceptually made that mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, equation that, that hot, it's heat. And right, so, right and, connection. And, yeah. Yeah, and David's lab proved that it's indeed the same. Um, Dr. Julius, you have written about beginning at UC San Francisco mm -hmm. and making a transition from thinking like a reductionist yeah. biochemist <laughs> yeah. to thinking like a physiologist. Mm -hmm. So there are many students out here who know exactly what that is but there are probably several who don't. And I wonder if you could talk about what that means and why it was hard and how that shaped you as a scientist. Yeah, I think I'm still in that transition phase. <laughs> I, mean, I think when you're trained as, somebody, as a biochemist or a molecular biologist like us, you know, it's when you're, when you're, well, everything changed with time as well. It also, you know, I was trained a long time ago because I'm an old guy, but, um, I got you beat on that. Yeah, okay. But, uh, but, you know, when you think about, when you're trained in an area where you're thinking about enzymes and kinetics, et cetera, you know, you have total control, or you think you have total control over everything. And, and you can be very quantitative. You can set up experiments so that they're designed to have, you know, as perfect a control as you can. And you can measure things very precisely. When you start working in the area of physiology, it's much more complex. And there are things that you don't know about that will affect your assays or what you're looking at. Um, you know, it's just the, the, the level of, first of all, the level of complexity is higher. Second of all, you know, I think the thing that, that in making this transition that affected me the most was what your expectations are. So when you're, for example, when I was in graduate school and, you know, using yeast genetics to study biochemistry, you know, you could express a gene and express expect to see like a 10 or a 100 fold change in activity to really prove your point. In physiology, you rarely deal with things on that order of magnitudes, you know, changes are more subtle. And so you have to retune your brain to understand that seeing somewhat more subtle effects can tell you something very profound about biology. And you just have to kind of adjust your order of magnitude and, 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 and know that you're not going to be able to control every facet of what's going on and have to think in a more complex way. Dr. Potapuni, and I see you nodding. Anything to um, add? I think, the, um, to me, in general, the, 
the reductionist approach, the way I would say it is that, you know, look at the question you want to answer and then reduce it mm -hmm. to the most simple system you can still get meaningful answer from. So for example, for us, it was the question, how do you sense touch? And after dabbling into directly finding it from neurons, we realized that none of these pressure sensing molecules were identified, whether it's from touch or hearing or blood vessel sensing blood pressure. And so we said, why not find it from a cell line where you can easily grow in a culture dish, in an incubator, um, much more easily to manipulate, to handle. And then once we find it, we can go back to what we call in vivo, which means in real life, so in tissues, and where it's expressed, where it's turned on, will tell us where the function is. We kind of got lucky because one of them was in the touch neurons. But to me, it was a very good lesson for me is to say that was the simplest system that was still meaningful to ask that question. Huh. Um, but it depends on the question. If you want to understand how consciousness works, you can't use a cell line in a culture dish to answer that question. So it really depends. Um, Dr. Padapudian, you have talked about, well, about how the sense of touch is, is pretty amazing. And that, for example, a person can sense indentations that are 500 times smaller than a human hair. But I just have to ask, how do you actually test that? <laughs> You know, that's something I, I, I do say, and I, and I don't get it either. That sounds pretty wild. It just sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I checked the primary paper, and indeed they, they have done this, and they just microfabricate, you know, different prints with smaller, smaller indentation, and they do, you know, psychophysical tests where you just go across the, the printed area and say which indentation is mm -hmm. bigger than the other. Oh my God. And you keep going lower and lower, and you get to this level where it sounds impossible, but, um, <laughs> but we, we can obviously do it. Um, and so there you go. <laughs> Pretty intense. Um, you have also, Dr. Padapudin, you've also written about um, your working and finding cold and noxious stimuli sensors, menthol, was it wasabi, was the other? Um, and you found yourself wondering, okay, which channels are actually converting this mecha these mechanical forces to signals? Maybe that's an obvious question to ask that question, but what, what made you ask it? Because it was uh, obvious, or I don't, I don't know. So, you know, before I started my own laboratory, I was a postdoc studying how these sensory neurons develop, because one of the things we knew was they were extremely specialized. So there are some neurons only sense cold, other only sense noxious, painful stimuli. Others have a variety of touch-related sensory mechanisms. And um, the transition to studying, uh, my thought was, instead of studying how they develop, what we started talking about. They do something phenomenal, which is transduce physical forces into a chemical or electrical signal that, that neurons will understand. And so that was the goal from the beginning. So at first, uh, um, you know, following David's cloning of the capsaicin receptor, we identified some temperature sensors. And uh, a few years later, the question was, what was the mechanosensor? So the whole program was specifically to look for them. So that was indeed the goal. I think the really cool thing, though, is I, I love those models, by the way. I think they're so, they make it so clear that it's actually just, okay, the membrane gets pushed and the channel physically gets open. It seems so simple and elegant, and of course, it is. Cool. Any? Yeah, Dr. Julius, I, I, I know that you also talked about in the video that, uh, that uh, different animals have different sensory uh, sensory systems and so I know that you've been working with uh, several different perhaps unusual creatures in your in your lab and and can you tell us a little bit about them and, and what you learned yeah so we've looked at animals that uh, you know appreciate changes in temperature for in different ways some of whom uh, in some of whom that sensation thermal sensation is very specialized and very acute and, and the reason we've done that is, one, to ask whether it, it's a shared mechanism with how we sense temperature. Two, to, if it is, 
maybe give us some more uh, information about how this process works at the structural and molecular level. And then just curiosity, you know, it's, and, and, and some of these animals are quite fascinating. So as you said, we've looked at these species like um, pit vipers, for example, like a rattlesnake that is able to quote unquote see in the infrared range. It's really not vision, but it's, um, it's again, really a, an aspect of somatosensation where it can detect uh, heat very acutely. For example, body heat that's radiated by something like a squirrel or something it wants to catch. Uh, and vampire bats are the only mammals that have a specialized structure that's sort of somewhat similar, at least in terms of its overall design, to a snake that enables it to be very sensitive to heat uh, in close proximity. And so, uh, you know, we've asked whether evolution has conserved a similar mechanism to do that. And in fact, it has. It continues to use these members of the so-called trip channel family to do that. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I think the, one of the interesting things about sensory physiology is that it's not just the molecular detectors that are really um, fascinating to look at, but it's the whole anatomical structure of the organ that subserves this purpose. So in the rattlesnake, this is something called a pit organ that is like a little pinhole camera for infrared radiation. And it has a very thin membrane that's decorated with sensory nerve fibers, like the ones that we would have in our body, but at very high density. And it has a very high density of one of these trip channels that's heat sensitive. So it, it's just beautiful to sort of understand how the molecular biology combines with the anatomy to endow these animals with a very sort of a souped up system for, mm. for detecting heat. And the other thing we've done is we've also worked on these cold sensors and we've asked whether there are differences in the this, in this threshold for activation, the thermal threshold, for these channels, do they activate at different temperatures, depending upon what the lifestyle niche of an animal is, or what its core body temperature is. So a bird has a higher core body temperature than a mammal, does its sensory receptors shift in keeping with its change in core body temperature? Because part of these, the, the role for these thermosensors is not just to detect things you know, in terms of pain to stay away from, but to let us know what the environmental temperature is so we can adjust our core body temperature mm -hmm. appropriately. And in fact, you do see evolutionary shifts with the threshold for these sensors in keeping with changes in core body temperature. So these studies really tell us a lot about evolution and physiology mm -hmm. and how sensory systems adapt to suit an animal's lifestyle. Yeah, and I don't know about you in the audience, but I, I think it would be really fun to have these infrared sensors receptors ourselves, I mean, would that be possible? Well, you do. You do in <laughs> your skin. I do. They're yeah. just not yeah. as, as, um, as highly evolved to, set, as in the to sense bats, temperature yeah. as it is in a vampire bat. Fortunately, yeah. you don't have to like, fly around and suck people's blood. <laughs> right, exactly. Blood. You're not looking for a vein that's carrying you know, war from a warm blood. It animal, sounds like so. a superpower. It would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it would be. Okay. Have you ever thought about... CRISPR maybe can help Yeah, yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> have you thought about studying polar bears? <laughs> no, we thought about, um, you know, when we were doing structures of channels and uh, we thought about looking at structures of these things from animals like penguins, et cetera, but... Um, no polar bears. No polar bears. Darn. Have to go up north, a little further up. Dr. Patapudian, you have talked about how the piezo ion channels that you discovered have played a role in sensing everything from when your bladder is full to blood pressure to bone density. So... This is kind of a silly question, but can you describe how your discovery actually helps us know when we have to pee? <laughs> um, sure. Uh, <laughs> it's a favorite topic. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, one of the interesting things about th these channels is, you know, at first it was more of a answering the question, yes, this is how you sense touch. But what I like the direction that we're going in is that it's uh, now informing about physiology. And one of the questions in the bladder that was actually um, not completely understood, there were some scientists who thought it was the nerves innervating the bladder that do the bladder stretch sensing. Others thought it was the urothelial cells around the bladder itself, non-neuronal cells, that do the sensing. Um, and so... Our work in collaboration with Alex Chesler's lab and I had showed, first of all, both in humans and in mice, that PSO2 is required for this sensation. So there are actually human individuals, very rare, but they do not have these PSO2 channels. And they actually can't tell when their bladder is full. So ever since they're kids, 
They oh. are in the habit of their parents have made them go to the restroom two, three times a day on a schedule to avoid accidents. Um, but other than this, we've actually found that the sensor is both in the neuron and in the bladder urothelial cells, and both are contributing to this signal. So it's, it's one of these emerging stories that uh, the sensor can be in two places, perhaps one amplifying the, huh. the other one. And so, yeah, we're finding out things that are very relevant to these individuals, but at the same time, new biology of where and how the sensors do this work. Well, we're, we're almost out of time, but I cannot resist to ask you this question, Dr. Julius. I, think I know what it's going to be. But you do? Right. Did you read my cards? <laughs> 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 okay. You wrote in your Cavalier biography yep. that you lived more of, than half your life in Northern oh, California. Yeah. Yeah. Different question, maybe, mm -hmm. but remain a native New Yorker in temperament and humor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, <laughs> there are not very many Americans in the audience. Okay. There are probably a few, mm -hmm. but I would love for you to talk about what that means and how that affects your research oh. and approach. Um, sarcasm is the word, I guess, that <laughs> New Yorkers, is something New Yorkers have that Californians don't seem to understand as well. But, uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, I think you, you retain roots from any place you grow up. I mean, I did spend my formative years in New York. Um, and so I love New York City, but uh, I'm... You love California. I'll stay in California, yeah. But um, how does that affect my work? Uh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that that has any direct... I think we all take something from our roots. Um, and there's a lot of transplanted New Yorkers in California. So <laughs> um, I think, you know, <clears throat> I should say that the great thing about science, in maybe an answer to your question that's different, is that science is done by all of us all over the world. And it doesn't matter where you come from or what your background is. The only thing you need to, to do... To, to have to do science is curiosity. And so whether you're from New York, you know, you might have a different sense of humor than if you're from California, or I should say a sense of humor, then, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from. You know, Artem comes from a different place. Now he lives in California and so do I. And, you know, we're both doing science in a lab full of people from all over the world. So science is an international thing. Pretty cool. All right. Well, I think we're out of time for just you two. Um, and so let me thank you. You will, we will be bringing you back for a group discussion afterwards. So, uh, yeah, okay. so now thank from... Thank you very yeah, much. Thank, thank you. So now we'll go from the sense of temperature and, and touch and we'll go into the brain. We'll move into the brain. And our 2022 Kavli laureates in neuroscience have pioneered the discovery of genes underlying a range of serious brain disorders. And first, we'll have a look at the uh, laureates' work in a video. The brain requires a lot of genes to get put together. We have about 20,000 genes in total in our genome, and the brain uses almost half of them. Uh, and so uh, that creates a lot of potential problems because if almost any one of those genes is not working properly, we can develop disorders of the brain like intellectual problems or cognitive problems. Our intellectual cognitive abilities, language, writing, speech, is much different than our non-human primate ancestors. And that's due to changes in the DNA that then impact the function and complexity of the brain. But along with that are changes in DNA that causes diseases. There are many types of mutations and we have a long way to understand the effect of most of them. We've had better success in identifying the mutations that impair genes because that's obvious. You've got someone who suffers from a disease and you study their DNA and you found a mutation, you can relate that to the cause. But we have a long way to, to identify as many mutations as possible that actually might confer protection and might improve health. The function of the ataxin-1 gene, its primary function is to encode and produce give the inf genetic information for the ataxin-1 protein. And when we talk about function of the gene, what we're really talking about in genes like ataxin-1 is we're talking about the function of the protein. 
And that's one of the major questions that we have, have tried to address over the years is because we think the function, the normal function, if you will, of the ataxin-1 protein is very much linked to the molecular aspects of why the mutation in that protein then causes the disease, spinal cerebellar ataxin type 1. And what we know so far is that an important function of the ataxin-1 protein is to regulate gene expression in a variety of cell types, not just the brain, but also some of the muscle and, and uh, other tissues in the body. And we're what we're trying to understand is why certain neurons are more susceptible to the mutation that disrupts that function or alters that function than other cells. And uh, that's an interesting biological question, but also perhaps in the root of answering that question it might give us better information of how to counteract the negative aspects of the disease-causing mutation in the gene slash protein. But at this time, we're focusing on the nucleus of the cells and regulation of gene expression in terms of its function. In 2003, the Human Genome Project determined that each human has six billion letters in its DNA three billion base pairs inherited from their parents. Each time we conceive a child, out of the six billion letters, there are actually about 60 that will change from parents to the child. Most of them have no effect. Some may have very mild effects, good or bad. And rarely, but not so rarely, it can lead to a dysfunction in a gene that is very important for the brain function. Many of them are not transmitted. Some of them are transmitted. Fragile X can be transmitted in a pretty bizarre way. But because there are new mutations happening at each generation, each time we conceive a new human, then it will stay this, this background of uh, people with such mutation and this is something we cannot really prevent unless the only way would be to sequence uh, in um, uh, every uh, fetus and then uh, not keep uh, those who have mutation that we can identify as very bad. But this would uh, uh, pose both ethical questions uh, because we don't always un uh, understand what a mutation effect is uh, and of course for the moment it's not uh, feasible or desirable. I think one interesting area that we're aiming for is to try to understand how the development of our brain predisposes us to various uh, disorders that might develop much later in life. So at the moment we know enough to know that the development of the brain uh, can predisposed to certain conditions that affect a child, like focal epilepsy or intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorders. We also know that there are roles for genes in creating other disorders that present late in life, like degenerative conditions or Alzheimer's disease. What we don't yet know, and I think we might understand more about soon, is how the pattern of development also contributes to what happens later in life. Not just the genes, but in fact, these exposures and so forth that can also uh, alter our genome in a way that happens uh, independent of what we inherit. I work on childhood neurodevelopmental disorders. In particular, one such disorder is called Rett syndrome. And that disease shows up much earlier in life. It typically shows up in the second year of life, uh, where the babies lose the skills they used to do and cannot speak and cannot learn new things and will not use their hands anymore. They will wring their hands and they have balance problem, but it's because of changes in the function of the brain early on. That disease is very different from the ataxia because it's only one in a family. The ataxia, I told you, it passed from generation to generation, so you have many affected individuals. In the case of Red syndrome, there'll be a couple who will have a child who's healthy, and then the next child may have Rett syndrome. Or maybe another couple, their first child will have Rett syndrome, but then they have other healthy children. 
So it's just one in a family, but it's sporadic. It's not inherited. Parents are healthy, child is affected, because in the sperm, in one sperm, out of the many, many healthy sperms that that father carries, one sperm will have a mutation. And if that sperm gets fertilized and becomes an embryo and then a child, that will bring on Rett syndrome. So this is a class of disorders which are genetic, but not inherited. So it's still caused by a gene, but it's a random mutation that happens. Please welcome on stage Huda Zogby, Harry Orr, Jean-Louis Mandel, and Christopher Walsh. Yes, please. Welcome and congratulations to all of you. We're so honored to have you here. So um, let me start with a question for you, um, Dr. Mandel. Uh, so you started your search for mutations that cause inherited disease on the X chromosome. And in 1991, you found the cause of the fragile X syndrome, which is an inherited form of intellectual disability and autism. Could you first explain to us who you know, might, a lot of us might not be really into this. Could you please uh, describe what this mutation looks like? So, uh, in this gene, uh, in a region that in principle is not that important, which is called the five prime untranslated uh, region, uh, you have a repetition of these three letters CGG, CGG, CGG. And normally you and me have between maybe uh, 10 and 35 or 40. Uh, but sometimes, especially when it's already 40, it can go to 45. Uh, and uh, three or four generations later, to 50 or 50 repeat, and it starts to be a bit like if you uh, type on the computer and you, know, you have to say GG, CGG, CG, you get bored. And then automatically it continues, you, you, you have your finger there and continues adding, adding, adding. And then the computer sends there is something abnormal and locks the thing. And this is what happens in this gene. Uh, when it's above 50 repeat, it starts to become instable in the family tendency to grow. And when it's over 200, then the gene is locked in an expression. It cannot function anymore. So this is uh, this uh, very bizarre mutation. We knew from the way that it was transmitted, very bizarre way it was transmitted in family, that there was something, some mutation that must be different from others, but we didn't know what it would be. Why do you say it was a bizarre way that it was transmitted? Yes, uh, it, it's a bizarre way because uh, the, uh, for a long time, you know, when you reconstruct things in families who have different affected uh, people, you kind of see that the, the, there must be a bad mutation coming from grandparents or before even, but they didn't show the disease. And suddenly, the risk of having the disease start to increase, but even it depends whether this mutation that we still didn't know is transmitted by a woman or by a man. So the, it, it was very bizarre. It had been, uh, there was uh, people actually in Hawaii doing research on Fragile X who did this epidemiology study. It was called the Sherman Paradox because it, it was really bizarre. And it's only when the molecular uh, basis was found that one could understood why this was. Mm. Because the, it does not, the, the repeat increase at one point more when it's transmitted by a female than when it's transmitted by a male. So this mm. oh, explains. Interesting. And now we know many more diseases, I understand, that, that are caused by the same type of, of um, mutation. And another example of, of a, such a repeat-based disorder is a, a disorder with a very difficult name, 
spinocerebellar ataxia 1 or SCAR 1. I understand it can be uh, shortened to that. And this is a de degenerative disease that causes problems with movement and balance. And that brings us to doctors Sogby and, and Orr, and you collaborated on the discovery of, of the gene responsible for SCAR1. So first to Dr. Orr, uh, could you explain us very simply how this mutation caused the disease? Um, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Because we that, him. That, that is, that the, the answer to that question is something that, that Huda, and our, our, as well as many other labs, are, are working on. Um, the, there are some clear issues. It, it, we think the, the expansion of the glutamine track in the protein itself, the protein itself is, is critical for how the disease develops. Um, and I, I think Huda will agree with me that the disease mechanism at the molecular level is very dependent on the normal function of this protein. So understanding the no its normal function is, is something we're working very hard on in hopes of better understanding how the disease develops. Um, so. so you don't know enough about how the, pro the normal protein works? Well, we know that it's important for regulating gene expression and uh, entry into the nucleus is critical for the disease to develop throughout the, the, the brain as well as uh, we think the, its role in pathogenesis in the muscle tissue too. Uh, so something about in the nucleus is, is critical for uh, uh, how the disease develops. But that's as far as I can go at this moment. Check back, well not with me, but check back in 15 or 20 years yeah. with others, with hopefully some of you out there will figure this yeah, out. Yeah, perhaps. And, and remarkably, I, I read that you made, uh, that, that you, you both identified the gene responsible for this disorder on the same day uh, in April 1993. How did you react when you heard of each other's discovery? We told each other. We yeah. sent faxes. Yeah, we were we did. <laughs> so one thing about our collaboration, it's also a history of communication. We used to use the phone a lot and the faxes, but, but now we text and email. <laughs> <laughs> I found it! Yeah. <laughs> no, we literally called each other on the phone. That's so shocking, though, yeah. that it just happened on the same day. I, I think it reflects how close we were working during the collaborative effort. We really were. It, each lab was dependent on the other lab. Is there, um, either for one or both of you, how, what made you realize that it could be, that SCA1 could be a repeat-based uh, neurological disease? So um, I was at Baylor College of Medicine where Tom Kasky was working on some disorders, including fragile X syndromes. So actually, David Nelson and Kasky, Kasky passed away this year, uh, was Steve Warren also discovered the fragile X syndrome. There were many you know, different independent groups. So that was known. But then I was in a conference where Kasky shared with us unpublished data that he just discovered that the myotonic dystrophy gene is also called, uh, caused by expansion of these trinucleotide repeats. And I'm a neurologist by training, and I knew something about myotonic dystrophy that I will never forget, where I would go in to see a baby in the intensive care unit, very sick with myotonic dystrophy. When I shake hands with the mother, she will have very mild disease. She won't be able to let go of my hand. That's called myotonia. Wow. And I remember that. I remember that mother have very mild, just this mm -hmm. inability to let go when you squeeze, mild myotonia. But the baby has severe myotonia. So I knew there was what we call now anticipation. The disease gets worse when it goes from one age to the other. And the family I studied was seven generations, the disease got worse and worse and worse from generation to generation, so is Harry's family. So I immediately thought then it must be this dynamic mutation, these repeats that get bigger and bigger from generation that to generation. They get amplified? Right, right. so we mm. talked on the phone and we designed oligos for all possible repeats and 
that's what led us to look for those rupees. And oh, cool. Found it. And Dr. Sogby, I want to ask you one more question. Um, because your career started by searching for the cause of another neurological disorder that we also saw in the video, this Rett syndrome. Can you tell us how you became interested in this disorder? I was interested in Rett syndrome really purely based on encounters I had when I was a first-year resident in child neurology. A child walked in. She was a perfectly healthy child up to two years of age. She could say words, use her hands, sing nursery rhymes. Always her dad is a professor at Texas A&M. She would always run to the door to greet him. And one day that stopped. She didn't go to greet him. And slowly she lost the use of her hands. And then slowly she was unable to walk and will fall and started holding her breath and over the years developed seizures and in, unable to plan her movements. So motor planning became a problem. So I saw her when she was five, so she has developed many of these symptoms. And I was really struck because she was healthy when she was born and this happened. And the same month I've seen her, Bank Hagbert from Sweden had reported for the first time in English on 35 cases in Europe who had Rett syndrome, and you read their description, they were all like her. Mm -hmm. And then a week later, I asked to see a child with cerebral palsy, and the girl was 12 year old, walked in my office wringing her hands, same story. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason I was really struck by the clinical picture. It wasn't degenerative, and they were born healthy, but after a period, they lost all their skills. So I thought this is going to be really a very important protein for brain function. And I was curious, what could it be? And I also found it very heart-wrenching. I imagined the pain of the child and the parents to go through normal life and then lose everything you learn. Mm. That's why yeah, I decided to work. Got to be heartbreaking. And I realized that you're now involved in also uh, developing a therapy for this disease. So how, how long, how far away do you think we are from that? So one thing we've learned as we studied this gene is that it is very important to have it at the right amount. It's on the X chromosome, which means males who have a single X, they have one copy. Females, they have two X chromosomes. So in every cell, only one X is active so that the males and the females are equal. And what happens is if you have a mutation on, on one of these X chromosomes that you typically get from the father, that means half of your cells have a gene mutation and half of your cells are healthy. So it's almost like a mosaic, right? Half and half. That gives you Rett syndrome. But because the male have a single X, when it's mutated, they're very severe. They typically die as infants. So as we were testing ideas to see how to add this gene, we quickly learned that this gene is very sensitive to the dose. If you have twice as much of it, it's also bad. And we discovered a disease Then, actually Linda Vanesh in Belgium have seen the patient. We discovered it in the mouse, and a year later, she discovered it in humans, that doubling the gene can cause disease. Huh. That's the one we're getting closer for therapy, because it's easier to lower something when you have twice normal level. And that disease caused lethality by 20 years of age in boys. And for RET, we're taking the opposite approach. We're trying to find a way to gently increase the protein, because 75% of the mutations still make a protein while not functional, still it's there. So that's the strategy we're taking for RET mm -hmm. right now. Dr. Walsh, um, you were initially studying how neurons migrate to the right place in the brain during development. When you came across patients who where this migration didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how that influenced your research from that point? Yeah, sure, Nancy. I, my, my original training was studying you know, mice and rats and tracking these cells as they migrated through the brain because I've always been fascinated by this general question of how just a bunch of cells in your body become the special ones that endow us with the ability to think and to create. Um, 
But here I was working on these mice and rats, which didn't really seem like the best way to get at the big questions. Uh, and then I'm also trained as a neurologist, taking care of patients. Uh, and so it was kind of frustrating working on these little animals uh, because you know, I was hoping to be able to do something um, to improve the world for patients. Uh, and so when I heard about this family that had an inherited disorder of this migration, it was really one of these rare moments you get in your life where everything just seemed to flow together, where suddenly it seemed like I would have an opportunity to do the best sort of, take the best approach to try to understand these problems of how the brain gets put together, but also uh, do it uh, while trying to help in some small way uh, mm -hmm. the treatment of epilepsy, which is what these patients tend to suffer from. But can you help us uh, understand what actually then, how does this affect these right. patients when, the, when these cells don't migrate to the right place? Yeah, yeah one, of my, one of the most amazing things about this condition is that most of the patients are female and their brain is a mosaic, just as Huda had described for Rett syndrome. But in this case, they're a mosaic of cells, brain cells that are in the right place and brain cells that are in the wrong place. So part of... Uh, the, the cells that are supposed to be in their cerebral cortex are way off to the side somewhere. And the fascinating thing for me is to sit down and talk to these people because they're just regular people. Some of them are medical students, some of them are CEOs. Uh, some of them, you know, we all have our quirks and some of them have their quirks. They generally suffer from epilepsy. Sometimes that epilepsy is very severe. Uh, but it's amazing to me to sit and, having first looked at the picture of their brain and see all these neurons in the wrong place, to sit down and look them in the eye and think to myself, gee, you know, are they using all of those brains that are out of position? And to contemplate the fact that the, it's, that the human brain can be wired in so many different ways and still be a human brain and still give us all of these talents. And so what does it mean then to be human in terms of the wiring of the brain? And what sort of wirings are consistent with being normal? And what sort of wirings are those that create diseases like Rett syndrome? But do we... So from particularly in, in the video, I had this uh -huh. sense that um, maybe there could be some, like you're exposed to some toxin when your brain is developing that uh -huh. might disturb the the movement of these different. Uh -huh. Is that is that? Do we know what causes this failure to migrate to the right place, or do well, we have um, suspect things? Sure. In the case of the particular uh, study that got me started as a geneticist. Um, there, the, the gene is, a, is required for the neurons to migrate properly. It actually forms part of the sort of uh, lining of the brain, uh, and there are probably a little disruptions in the lining that in turn just kind of disrupts the architecture that blocks the migration of the neurons. So the neurons themselves seem to be normal, and remarkably, even though they're in totally the wrong place, sometimes when a patient is moving their finger or saying words, those neurons will light up just the way the normal neurons will do. So it seems like even though they're totally out of position, they still seem to be used uh, in conscious thought and activity. And some cases. So um, the, does this ha tell us that the brain is very plastic? It sounds like we can just uh, you can we can just uh, fix it. Uh -huh. right. Well, so that's the that's the challenge, isn't it? So y yes and no. Uh, on the one hand, the brain is tremendously plastic. Uh, I have seen uh, patients with intractable epilepsy that have had the entire right half of their brain removed, uh, and uh, one boy uh, is. He uh, learned to walk, he learned to read, he writes, he reads at grade level, and so uh, that means that so many of the functions of his right brain were rewired onto his left brain. And yet at the same time, we see all of these unfortunate conditions of intellectual disabilities or autism spectrum disorders, where the, the wiring seems to be very abnormal, and somehow they lack the plasticity for that to be repaired. And I think that's the fundamental mystery, uh, is how do we, what's different between these different conditions. Uh, shall we invite the 2020 laureates up? Yes, we can do that. So we would now like to invite uh, Ardem Parkodium and Parker Julian and as David. well. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's mic'd up. Yep. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So now we'd like to uh, to have to you know to have a free discussion here uh, and uh, to see if there's any 
maybe perhaps any cross fertilization uh, across uh, across your <laughs> topic and also in this session we will have uh, room for some questions from the audience so if any of you now have some question you would like to ask uh, you can have a you can look out for um there's will be someone walking around with a microphone here where's our microphone person so we'll oh, no he's gone he's <laughs> coming back i'm sure any, well, should we start now? Does anyone in the audience have a question for our esteemed panel? <laughs> oh. Well, we'll give you time to think a little bit. Right, so, so Uni mentioned this. Um, you're all working on, uh, you're working on touch and taste, genes for serious brain disorders. Now you're sitting in this room together. Does any of this, uh, thinking about these other lines of research spur any uh, big eureka moments in your head or questions or, I see Dr. Julius here maybe have something to say. Um, well, you know, it's always, look, we're all, we're all trying to figure out, you know, the molecular basis or the, the mechanistic basis for how the brain works or how the nervous system works. So I think it's all this kind of a uniformity of, interest. I mean, I'm fascinated listening to Chris about the idea that, you know, you can have this total miswiring in the brain in, in one way that leaves you with these major deficits and in other ways where you have this incredible compensation. I mean, that's certainly relevant in, in my area when you think about chronic pain syndromes. We focus on the periphery, but, you know, pain requires the brain and the spinal cord, and there are probably similar rearrangements that occur in the context of injury some of which lead to pain that may resolve, in other cases, never resolves. Uh, and so there are probably some similar, you know, underlying concepts that go on. And, uh, you know, it's just a lot of commonality in understanding how neurons work. They're all excitable and how they wire up together. Any other? I think the, um, what inspires me about the, this year's laureates is the close collaboration of human and mouse genetics. and how that's really uh, is a very powerful combination. And um, I mentioned in our case some you know, human individuals who have these uh, disorders that's related to touch and pain, but um, I think we're in a, the genomics era of, of biology where not only serious diseases, but uh, small mutations that have very small effects are being discovered by this massive sequencing um, of uh, humanity and associating their medical records with their genotypes is really a fantastic opportunity for future generations to look at these questions and discover much, much more by, uh, again, identifying things in humans and then bringing it back to mice for mechanistic understanding. Oh, so you find it in humans and then you go to the mice. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of my that, lab's that, doing now. Yeah. That was our... Yeah. Approach. Approach, but yeah. I believe some of the work you started in Drosophila, didn't you? Well, I didn't, but the field did, yeah, field did in terms yeah. of discovering and yeast, trip channels. you started with yeast. Yeah, well, you know, we're all connected by evolution. So <laughs> not everything's the same. I mean, yeast use mechanosensors that are different than the ones that Artem discovered. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the underlying biology is connected by evolution. So evolution's the great teacher of biology, one of the great and I think we all take advantage of that in different ways. I, I guess a general point I would raise, you know, the pain and touch fields started, they understood function, and now they're starting to use that information to understand dysfunction. Where for those of us working on disease, we start with dysfunction, and we're starting to use that to understand function and how, how the, the brain works uh, better normally. So it's sort of this balance between function and dysfunction to move forward the, the whole field of understanding huh, how really interesting the brain to works. <laughs> so you're attacking the problem from two different yeah, sides. Yeah, both ways. Two different, yeah. two different entry points. Yes. Yeah. And maybe I can build on that because sitting, you know, through the whole discussion, <coughs> just for the sake of the student, what really at the end of the day it comes down to how much science can impact society. Mm -hmm. Whether, you know, I was a clinician and I went to science to help my patients. And that led to discovery that helped with diagnostics and possibly therapy. Now, you know, Ardem and David, 
they started with a curiosity, totally independent. They had no thoughts about disease. But both of them have been contributing now. They encountered people with mutations in some of the genes, or you're thinking about chronic pain. So your discovery, which was curiosity-driven, is now going to help society. So I think if there's one thing that cut across all of this is the really the power of science to change the way we deal with problems all right. of health. Yeah. It's here for science. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Woo! other thing, too, is that, and extending what Huda said, is that you know, you choose a problem to work on because you're fascinated by it, and if it's good science, it will make a contribution. And it's impossible to predict what you're going to dis whether what you're going to discover, how it will contribute to the body of knowledge, and whether it will solve a disease. I mean, CRISPR was not discovered because people were trying to solve, understand a disease, or even you know, uh, a, a a known functional problem necessarily. Uh, and so, and this is true for people who spent their life studying proteases, and now it turns out that drugs that inhibit those proteases are used to treat um, HIV and you know AIDS. And so, I think you work on something because you think it's a tractable problem, it's an interesting problem, you can look at it rigorously, and have faith that that body of knowledge will contribute to something that eventually will be useful. But mm. I don't think you have to know that ahead of time to choose an interesting problem because it's really based in a lot of cases on curiosity. And the CRISPR, by the way, got the Kavli Prize some years ago. <laughs> These so, guys already won the yeah, Nobel I, Prize. <laughs> but, uh, the other guys will. <laughs> some, of, some of the young <laughs> people in the audience here, they might be wondering if a career in science is something for them. So what would you say is the important characteristic for, doing, for a person doing science? What has been important for you? <laughs> Curiosity. Uh, curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Harry. That was, I'm, yeah. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> curiosity, um, and I also am a strong believer of maintaining an open mind. Mm -hmm. You want to, if something interesting comes in from left field, you want to be able to grab it and run with it. Uh, so um, curiosity and the the willingness to, to, to move into a different direction that you hadn't predicted that that's where you would go. Um, and for me, the exciting thing about research and science is uh, it's a constantly changing field. Um, so I grew up outside of Detroit, and summers I would work in the assembly plant, and I was paid quite a good wage just to put this bolt in the same place in every <laughs> car that was coming down the assembly line. And I, that was a great education for me because I realized that no matter how well I was being paid, it was boring yeah. as hell. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I needed something different. And I think the, the nice thing about research and science is, is it's always different. I think another important characteristic uh, is a disrespect for authority. Uh, oh, yeah. So uh, you see us all up here in our fancy clothes, mm -hmm. you know, Kavli prizes. Well, some of and us are. And for many of you, <laughs> and, and to many of you, we may symbolize authority. Uh, and yet, we got where we are by disrespecting authority. And science, mm. you think of as done, you know, on these movies, you see these people in these lab coats, but it's really done in, by people in T-shirts and shorts and sandals whenever they can. <laughs> uh, We're which reporting they can't here always to the if you're using HMS. radial activity. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but um, the, essential, the essential need for a successful scientist is someone who listens to something and say, I don't believe that, I don't think that's true, uh, and is ready to attack dogma. Uh, and so, again, I, it, I think it's just really important, I didn't realize that, because, you know, again, you learn science in school, and you're learning the dogma, and you go into the laboratory of that course, and the best you can hope to do is reproduce something that's been done right. a bajillion times before, and all you can do is fail to reproduce something that's already been done, and you get a bad lab report and all that stuff, but that's not real science. Real science is actually trying to you know, trying to figure out how to do something really weird for the first time, uh, and then just sort of see what happens. So it's more like, you know, a chemistry set, or you know, mm. trying to do something that might All right, be. we have a questioner yeah. here. 
Hi, is this working? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question that's actually related to what you were all saying, you know, what it takes to be a scientist, what advice you might give. I was wondering if any of you could share a story about a time where maybe you were feeling a little discouraged or unsure of yourself, and because, <laughs> you know, we're all human, and even the person who can be really sure sometimes might have low moments, how you got through that or how you kept your conviction and that determination because obviously these discoveries took years. It's not like this was something that happened quickly and you probably went a long time at times without any encouragement either from your results or from the people around you. Oh, Who wants yeah. to start? I think we've all been through that. You know, I, I remember there's a guy named Carl Jurassi who died a few years ago who was a, a very well-known chemist uh, and I remember when I was a student reading an interview with him in the San Francisco Chronicle where he said research is like walking through a desert where there's some very high peaks and then these very long valleys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there's some truth to that. I, when I was a postdoctoral fellow, I changed fields from yeast genetics and then going into molecular neurobiology. And, um, you know, I sort of had to find my bearings and technically and intellectually. And, you know, I went for about four years without really having anything that was publishable. And that, that was a tough time. And um, I think, you know, if you, you, you have to, you have to <clears throat> give yourself a break and realize if you're trying to do something that's challenging, that it takes time to develop your own skills. And you could get lucky, but it usually takes a long time. I think this, I always tell my students, is persistence pays off. So if you're really interested in the problem, um, you know, you just keep after it. And it could be that you're aiming for a certain problem and then somebody does it before you, and then, but there's always another question to ask. There's always a next, next stage, there's always another goal. And the other thing I would say from the other side of it is a mentor. Uh, and looking back at my mentors, you know, my, my mentors when I was having those, those valley days of, of looking for the peaks, you know, they supported me. They never made me feel like I was a failure. They just said, you're trying to do something challenging. And, and those, they supported me to do that, so I try and remember that with people in my own lab who are taking risks, and I know it's going to take them a while. Just, you know, support them as much as you can. And if they continue to be passionate about it, they'll run into something interesting. I would just add on, in addition to the relationship with your mentor, is your fellow students and colleagues at the same stage that you're at, is I think it's the nice thing about science is, is you're part of a community. and. Um, Going out in the afternoon, perhaps with your friends for a drink or two at the local <laughs> watering hole, watering hole, and talking about all the things you're going through and and, and how who's solved what problem and so forth is is a, I think a, a, a very productive way of working through those issues. <laughs> Dr. Mandel, uh, I would uh, ask actually, are there any students in political sciences here? Yes. Any political science? Or things? maybe they start with, because I think what I was struck is, of course, uh, and I, uh, when I talk to, to lay people, I try to use these examples of things that would look uninteresting for mankind, for humanity, like uh, while Medusa, I don't remember what it is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, glowing green, you know, fluorescent green. Uh, and the Japanese guy spent 10 years trying to find out why are they fluorescent. If he had written that, uh, you know, he wants to cure cancer with this or help cancer research, one would have said, uh, you are probably not in your right mind. <laughs> and this green fluorescent protein, now there is not a single lab not using it. And I don't know whether uh, when you write, wrote your grant uh, on caps, uh, you know, uh, for doing the study on capsaicin, mm -hmm. Uh, if you say, you know, I want to uh, understand why when you eat red chili, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it make a large effect because people will say, okay, so who is interested by... Uh, but then, you know, uh, I, I think it, people in science administration, because you need also money for doing uh, research. And I think that... Uh, People in administration, in policy, etc., should uh, understand that you should not always look for the uh, uh, um, short-time benefit. Okay, mm -hmm. within two years, I will have solved this problem, <laughs> and I will be able to sell or to create a company and to uh, to sell some va valuable goods. There are things 
that didn't like CRISPR as an example, uh, but there are many other examples that something that uh, did not at first uh, look like applicable, maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years later, may open uh, a new thing. So I think uh, curiosity is very important, but it's important also that science administrators and, uh, uh, and politicians understand that at least it's important to keep this curiosity-driven science and to make it possible by funding student fellowships, mm -hmm. postdoc fellowships, etc. Anyone else want to add to this? So. Um, perhaps I want to come back to the question of having dry spells in your career. I probably win the prize for the longest dry spell, <laughs> 16 years, pretty much. So when I started looking for the Rett syndrome gene, as you've heard, it's a sporadic disease, and this was 1980s, early 1980s. The genome was not sequenced. And to find the gene in a child who's just randomly born in a family was hard. And people thought that was really, really crazy. I was discouraged. In fact, my mentor said, you couldn't work on this in my lab. Pick another problem. That's what we picked as CA1. But the point of that, it took a long time. The technology wasn't there. But what kept me, I would say, two things. Having seen the girls oh. and having paid attention that every one of them looked the same convinced me there has to be a gene. This is a program that's happening after birth, it had to be a gene. And the second thing is naivety. I was young and naive. <laughs> and I thought I should trust my instinct in spite of what everyone else is telling me. And that's beautiful. You are all young and that's why we need you. I think youth is really, you're daring. You take more risk when you're young. I think everybody on this panel probably can remember some things they've done that are a little bit more risky and they were passionate about. So I think that negative <laughs> period, what helped me get through it is working on SCA1 where there's some things happening and also having some life outside the lab because in science you have many negative data. So you, you sort of do something else that might give you a reward. Is it music? Is it sport, whatever it is, to get by for those days. But eventually, I think the rewards are unmatchable. Even when you make a very, very small discovery, it's when you walk into the lab and not knowing what your student will show you today, no matter how small it is, it's <laughs> extremely exciting. And that's what I look forward to every day when I go to work. Do we have a questioner? All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think following to what you mentioned, Huda, in terms of having something outside the lab, um, so what are your, I guess it's for all of the panels, but what are your suggestions in terms of making a balance between work and life? The science requires commitment, and you've all shown in your work, but then also you all have like families and kids, and so how do you nurture this, and how do you find the balance? And so that would be great to hear some thoughts on that too. Anybody want to tackle that? I guess uh, when I was a postdoctoral fellow, so training um, and was going to apply for assistant professor job, um, I realized that I was going to be very busy doing the interviews, writing applications, going on interviews. So um, I had to work much less in the lab. And at that time, I decided that I was going to be very tough on myself and ask, do I really need to do this experiment? And after this six-month session, when I had to give a group meeting to our group, I realized that was my most efficient and most productive six months <laughs> of, the, um, of my postdoc career. So the message is not don't work hard, because obviously that's required at many stages of uh, your training to learn. But I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on number of hours working instead of smart working. And um, hmm. again, I've had this so much where, you know, oh, if I read the literature a little bit more, I could have saved a few months of work. And so um, at least biology research is a funny combination of very intellectual work and 
for lack of better word, grunt work. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I've become a huge believer that keeping that balance right will allow you to have extra time to spend with friends and family. And, um, and actually, I've said this before, almost all of my good ideas have come while I'm hiking, running, doing something outside. And so, um, yes, work hard, but think hard as well. It's very important to keep reminding everybody. Mm. Well, the countdown clock says we only have 26 seconds, but the wall clock says we have a couple more minutes. Yes, yeah, so do any so of you have anything to yeah? Maybe I was going to yeah? follow up a little bit with Artem's. I, I tell my students and people in the lab it's very important to go out and reboot. And so my rebooting is every year for a week, I go out to the western United States and go river rafting either on the Colorado or the Green River. And there's three issues. It's absolutely spectacular scenery. It's very challenging. And there's incredible archaeology. Uh, people were there a, a, a thousand, two thousand, and actually I've held a Clovis point that was 12,000 years old. Wow. But the critical thing is you're off the grid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your cell phone is useless, <laughs> other than a camera. And being <laughs> off the grid and not having to worry about checking your email or your text for several days is very restorative. I, I have to share this because um, I did this, I, I was canoeing in Sweden where there was very little cell coverage and my daughter was like a month out from giving birth. So I'll let you guess what happened while I was canoeing. <laughs> <laughs> I became a grandmother. Oh, yeah, I almost became a parent one year, but that's another <laughs> issue. <laughs> Are there any other questions from well, the audience? Well, I was rafting. I, 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 don't want to get <laughs> I don't want that to be misinterpreted. <laughs> we'll, we'll forgive you. Other questions? I, I have one, if nobody else does. I, I'm, really, I'm really fascinated by this sort of balance between basic research and applied, because you all here res, uh, uh, pr uh, represent that spectrum. And um, part of what I wonder is, for example, you've talked about the applications, and you, Dr. Padapudin, you've talked about the applications of what you're finding. I mean, do you, uh, how much push and pull is there in this kind of work? You're working more in, you have a clinical approach, and you're actually trying to solve, uh, cure a disease. But I wonder if you can reflect a little bit on that. What keeps you in the lab and not doing clinical applied stuff, or what keeps you doing clinical stuff and maybe less applied? Well, I don't have an MD, so if I touch a patient, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but uh, aside from that, um, look, I think that, um, you know, you focus in an area where you're interested in, where you think you can be effective, number one. And two, I think, you know, this is a continuum. So I, I think anything that we do in terms of basic research will eventually drive will support people, for example, in drug companies who want to do screening for, you know, new analgesic drugs. You know, we're working on atomic structures that will help inform them about how to do that and the way these molecules work. So, you know, we're not in the lab screening for drugs ourselves, and I don't run, you know, I haven't started a company or anything like that, but I know that the work, and, and I would like to see those things done. I mean, I would love for nothing else than, you know, some pharmaceutical house to develop the next big powerhouse drug that's based on discoveries that, you know, our labs have done. But I don't feel that I need to be in there doing that part because I feel like I'm helping to drive that to eventuality by just learning more about how everything works, putting it in the literature, and letting people take advantage of that to do it. And that's just you know my personal choice as to how I want to spend my time. I guess I'm personally fascinated by the fact that uh, you know all of us are experiments of nature uh, as Jean-Louis pointed out on the video we all have 60 mutations maybe 80 mutations relative to our parents and then every time our cells divide they never never copy their DNA quite right and so we all have billions of mutations that are limited to certain cells in our body uh, and so uh, you know nature just makes us with all of these mutations relative to our parents and then just puts us out there and sees what makes it and what doesn't. Uh, and so I just find that endlessly fascinating, but that's just what fascinates me. I think everyone has their own approach to science that's the right fit for them. 
Did you want to say something? Um, I just want to highlight that actually I do a lot of my work is 90% basic because okay. it's only from the basic work I can come with threads that will go to translation. So I only mm -hmm. take it so far and then others on the clinical realm pick it up. So I, I just want to emphasize to develop therapies, we have to do the critical basic work. Well, that sounds like a good place to wrap up. I really want to thank you all very much for a terrific session to give us some insights into how you do your science, and hopefully to inspire the students out here. So let's have a round of applause for our Pavli laureate.